Welcome to Talking Giants presented by Sea Geek. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co host, Justin Pennick, and we've got ourselves a Giants Seahawks preview. We've got the you were, uh, Eli Manning was benched for you, Bowl, and Geno Smith versus Daniel Jones. We got an interview with Matty Brown uh, later, and then obviously Danny King will come on to finish off the podcast with some segments. Justin, we did a whole long Kadarius, not a whole, we did a Kadarius Tony uh, traded podcast, so we're not going to hit on that. But how are you feeling going into the Seahawks game? You kind of forgot that we had a game this weekend after all the Kadarius Tony uh, melee. Yeah, got a game, and it's a huge game, man. Every game's a big game, but especially this one feels even bigger. At least it feels bigger to me. Yeah, check out the Kadarius Tony reaction pod. It was nice, quick and short, 18, 19 minutes, stuff like that. Had a lot of fun with that. Um, Bobby, man, this Seahawks team, it's starting to feel like this is the best team that we've played so far. Let's just start off with that. Are the Seattle Seahawks right now the best team that we have played so far this season, in your opinion? No. I think they're the most dangerous, though. Yeah, their offense is, is pretty damn good, but their defense is pretty bad uh, as well. I think the Dallas Cowboys are are a better team that we've played. Um, I even think the Titans are better than them. Um I don't know. I'm not totally in on the Seahawks because their defense is so bad. Like I think their their defense is just really bad now. They're they're first place at four and three in the NFC West, so they're they're they've been surprising. But um, yeah, I, I don't think they're the best. So I definitely think they're like a good amount better than like the Jaguars we just played. Yeah, I think the thing that makes this game unique and extra challenging is that we are playing it on the road. Um, the Seahawks have had some good wins. Um. At home uh, against the Chargers last week. It was in L.A., but I basically feel like if you're, any time that you're playing in L.A., it's not like that team doesn't have home field advantage. They kept the Cardinals to nine points, so I think their defense the last couple weeks has actually played a little bit better compared to the start of the season. Uh, the Saints, uh, they were on the road, and they lost. They had a good win against the Lions uh, on the road. Uh, the Falcons, they were home. They lost, but uh, the Broncos, they were home, and they won. So I think this game... The fact that it's in Seattle changes it. Like, I'm a little bit more worried, and I, I view the Seattle team as a lot more dangerous team in Seattle versus if they were flying across country to play the Giants in Jersey. Yeah, that's fair, but I, I, I just don't get too caught up in the home. I get I get Seattle has a big home field advantage, but, you know, we did fly to London and beat the Packers, who, who do look like they suck. Um, but as far as, as this Seahawks team, let's break it down first. This episode was brought to you by... Some very, very special people. We got H. Carson, 1979. How about that? Hunter Van Alstein. I kind of like that. It seems like a, like a cool band name. Matt from the PNW. Uh, I don't know where PNW is. Raphael Rosier. Kevin uh, McVicar. Connor Moore. Elijah Moore's uh, brother. Peter Poyle. Tabasco. Lair- the names are getting a little ridiculous. And then J.J. <laughs> Heindel. Uh Justin, who are these people? Bobby, I need to comment to your left, my right. Look at that beautiful sunset behind you. Oh, word. Oh, word. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, that sky's like pink. It's the Florida sunset. Florida sunset. Those wonderful people went to patreon.com slash talking giants. Just month plus mother tears. They sponsor today's episode. Plus, they get to hang out with us live. On Victory Mondays, except we celebrate them a little bit earlier on Patreon because we record our podcasts and our shows on Sunday to be released for Victory Monday. So they get to hang out with us live. They get to chat with us. Uh, Bobby Skinner will send you some stickers, magnets in the mail. Plus, twice a month, there's some shirt raffles. Patreon.com slash Talking Giants. Thanks for our patrons. Love you. All right, Justin, the Seahawks offense, we're going to start with it. And we're going to start with our old friend, Geno Smith. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? You know, these all these years later, we'd be facing off first Geno Smith with Davis Webb on the Giants roster still, and the guy who was drafted to be Giant uh, Eli Manning's replacement, Daniel Jones. Like the actual, we have the actual Daniel Jones replacement on the roster, and then Geno Smith and Davis Webb in this game. Um, Geno Smith has the highest completion percentage in the NFL at seventy three point five percent, but with that. 
he has a decent like average depth of target. You know, this isn't just dink and dunk Geno Smith, even though there is a lot of quick game um, into what they're doing. Like he's, there's a lot of good pre-snap reading of what Geno's doing, and Geno's just accurate. Like he's always been uh, a fairly accurate quarterback. Now, DK Metcalf is not playing in this game, and I think that is a pretty big loss for the Seahawks, Justin. But they still. They uh they spread this ball they spread the ball around like Lockett I think has been their most important wide receiver and then we'll talk about the tight ends but DK Metcalf being out I do think is a bigger deal than we're talking about. Yeah, uh, especially since the Giants don't have multiple go to cornerbacks. Right, Fabian Moreau is awesome, but uh, I'm feeling a a lot worse about Fabian Moreau if <laughs> if he's got to go up against DK Metcalf. I'm feeling a lot worse about anybody if they got to go up against DK Metcalf. But Gino, man. He's been a top five quarterback in the National Football League this year. He he, he has. Uh, the advanced stuff backs it up. And then also just the eye test, too, where he's leading receivers open. There are guy, there are certain guys that aren't open, but just his, the touch that he puts on the ball, uh, the ball placement, his ability to throw off platform, too. Like, the things that you ask really good quarterbacks to do to separate themselves – Geno Smith is doing it. And, you know, over, you know, on the, we're doing more stuff for John Boy Media Football. The Seahawks have just been this team in general that I find myself watching at least almost every other week just because they're so fun and they're also so frustrating because their defense can be good, their defense can be bad. And Geno Smith has been the consistent thing, though, that has been really, really good for them along with them running the ball as well. But Geno has been really, really fun. Yeah, so with DK Metcalf out, Tyler Lockett is essentially their number one threat. Uh, and he's always been a really good player. And he is catching on targets of 10 yards or less. 28 catches on 29 targets. You know, so he's getting he's catching literally everything besides one pass this year, which actually ended up being an interception, funny enough. Uh, that is in the quick game. And that's going to be huge for them. So I, I really think... And also, but like Tyler Lockett is a deep threat too. You know, he's gotten, he's caught in five of eight targets on deep passes. So I, I know the Giants can get cute with the door. Not cute. They can use, they don't just always just put a door at Jackson on wide receiver one. They look for matchups, you know, like he, he faced up against Evan Ingram a lot last week. Uh, you know, they put him on Robbie Anderson instead of DJ Moore versus Carolina. I do think with their skill sets, that Adore Jackson should be mirroring Tyler Lockett all all game. Like never make never give Tyler Lockett a favorable matchup. Yeah, I kind of don't mind if you're getting beat behind the sticks or between zero to nine yards. I do mind if you're getting beat deep. And Adore Jackson, I think is the fastest guy on the team. So give him the opportunity to go stride for stride with Tyler Lockett. Maybe make a play on the football, force pass deflection, get an interception, something. The second priority defensively this game has to be stopping Tyler Lockett when Geno Smith wants to target him deep and hopefully it's Adore Jackson is the one that's uh that's trailing him yeah and Adore is great at stopping the deep pass like really yeah. the only one he's given up as a giant I think was to um Dar- I think it was Darnell Mooney versus the Bears was like the, was the only one that sticks out in my mind is like a 20 plus yard pass that he's given up um actually Ricky Seals Jones but that was a whole different thing uh yeah. last last season so yeah, I put a door because Adore, you don't have to sacrifice like the short game to stop the big plays type of stuff. Um, even though they do play him on off coverage. Now the tight ends, it's a diverse group. They have three different guys with Will Disley, Noah Fant, and then uh Parkinson. They have forty eight catches this year between the tight ends for five hundred five yards on an eighty six percent catch rate. And they are they are just always have been like that t- that middle of the field safety blanket for Geno Smith has been the t- uh, the tight end like and and it's 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 uh it's very diverse in what they do like uh, Disley has tw- uh 20, 20 catches or nineteen catches uh I think Fant has twenty catches and then uh the the kid out of Stanford has seven like they split it up pretty well I think they all can block too right Fant really isn't a blocker like he's not the worst blocking tight end in the NFL but I think their blocking is huge in like the Seahawks run game. Um, but it's just, I worry about those tight ends because there's there's not just one guy you can key in on because Fan obviously is the mismatch speed wise. Will Disley's a pretty damn, a pretty good water, uh, pretty decent receiver in the NFL. Like he's been that for a little while now. Um, 
but that's where the Giants have struggled in coverages at a lot of times is like that middle, like, you know, they're linebackers. Like, Tay Crowder has struggled at times. Jalen Smith has been really bad in coverage. And we saw, obviously, what Mark An- Mark Andrews is a totally different animal. But that does worry me a little bit if you're manning up guys because, like, you got to, you got to, you're going to be forced to put a linebacker on them. But I think we're going to run a lot of three safety stuff with Dane Belton because that's what we usually do versus these tight end formations. Well, that scares me because. We're avoiding the elephant in the room right now where we're not talking about the Seahawks r- running game yet, which I think we're going to get to next. But why I say this Seahawks team, I mean, especially this offense, it's the most dangerous offense that we face so far. Baltimore, they have two ways to be effective. They have Lamar Jackson on the ground throwing it and then Lamar Jackson throwing it to Mark Andrews. So it was keying in on that facet of the game. Um, Green Bay. They didn't have a lot of weapons necessarily outside of their running backs that you can point to and be like, what do you have to stop? Tennessee, besides Derrick Henry, not really a lot of weapons. Now, it's really helpful that DK Metcalf's not playing, like we said to start, but you still have these three tight ends who Will Disley, I I view Will Disley as like a solid, okay tight end one. He's had some injuries in his career. And then obviously they get Noah Fant in the Russell Wilson trade, and you have Tyler Lockett on the outside. So the Giants defense, I feel like they've been really good this year whenever they've had to key in on one specific thing or one specific player to stop, and then they've been able to sacrifice some other things going well for an opposing offense for the purpose of stopping the main thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I think the Jaguars, that was what worried us about the Jaguars last week. Yeah. Now the Seahawks are better, but at the like. So that part of me is like, okay, well, they held the Jaguars to 17 points, but also that was the giant, the defense's worst game was the Jaguars. Right. They moved the so ball. That, that is what worries me is, is, you know, they do spread the ball around, but with their running game, um, they like to get, bring the tight ends in and they like to run outside and they kind of live and die on, on, on the big play on the outside runs. But I, I don't know if I fear Cause they don't, they don't do a lot of like a, bunch of stuff and a lot of times it's kenneth walker bouncing you know like it's not always just like these design counters or these toss plays and they have that stuff but a lot of times it is kenny kenny walker bouncing the play and i don't think that's the giants weaknesses because i think they can set good edges in the run the issue is when they're doing pin and pull and they're bringing wide receivers down on crack blocks which again i think they'll probably try and incorporate versus the giants but if you're going to bring these safeties on the field, like this has to be a week where you get your DBs on page. Like, like, man, you guys got to know where you're filling in the run. You know, like Travis Etienne's big run last week was because Darnay Holmes played. He got, he got, uh, he got greedy and tried to make a tackle on Travis Etienne and it screwed Julian Love and they had a 51 yard run. Like that should have been a five yard run at max. So like, obviously the linebackers getting over the top is an issue, but the DBs have to be a huge part of the run defense this week. Yeah, Bobby, you know, you're talking about how you want to use three safety sets with Belton, Love, and McKinney. But then the issue is, is that, well, you mentioned how a DB playing the run last week outside the tackles screwed us. So that's the issue that you that you kind of run into where if the Seahawks are going to run out of these heavy personnels where they're going to have 13 personnel, tire lock it on the outside, and then these three solid tight ends on the field. And if you want to put more secondary players on the box, then that's an advantage offense. So every week, Bobby, you know, you do your your favorite runs of the week, and I gather them for you. Every single week this season, doesn't matter if it was with Rashad Penny, who's now out for the year, or it's with Kenneth, Kenneth Walker. Every single week, I find that one of the top four or five runs of the week, I'm including a Seattle Seahawk 40, 50, 60-yard run every single week and it is just on repeat at this point so it's been even better than the lions yeah well when i say bring the safeties in though i also like i think we should play out of our big nickel defense where dane belton's essentially the nickel um how about landon you know, collins take, take take darnay holmes off the field you know I've, yeah you could bring landon collins in on those like those dime sets but you take darnay holmes off the field and you bring dane belton on as like essentially the nickel and then you play either you know uh four inside you know like four three d linemen three linebackers which they've done a lot or two d linemen four linebackers type of things yeah uh but you know taking darnay holmes off the field who again like one they they like to run those two tight end sets so 
Darnay is not going to be on the field a ton anyways. You're going to be at your base, but you can run that base out of that, be that yeah. big nickel stuff. So, um, We've spent a lot of time on the Seahawks offense. We've spent like almost 15 minutes on it. Um, yeah. The final thing I want to touch on is Charles Cross. Charles Cross is going to be the left tackle. Um, he was a guy that you know we talked a lot about this offseason. Basically, long story short, Bobby, you're a little bit more technical on this stuff than I am, but I watched Charles Cross versus Khalil Mack this week. Charles Cross is fast, man. Um, he's fast. He's quick. Uh, I don't know if you're going to beat him around the edge. Uh, I think Kayvon at this point may be a little bit faster than Khalil Mack from the Chargers because Khalil Mack has gotten a little old. He looked a little washed. I want to see these guys, whether it is Leonard Williams lining up out there since you'd still have uh, a little bit of a weak edge room depth-wise, whether it is Leo or whether it is Kayvon Thibodeau out there, I want them using power. Use power. Get Charles Cross on his heels. Force him to anchor down. Yeah, like hit him with strength. Hit him with bull. Like stop. To, I hate when they like teams do it. Like like know, know who your your guys are. Like go 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 after power. I I, I can't stand when like you see guy like going trying to go and scan Charles Cross and trying to kill him with speed. Go with power. You know, speed the power with him. Like Sam Williams wrote the playbook for facing Charles Cross. Mm. Um. So and Kayvon should do that. And Kayvon's got no issue doing that. So I I very much look forward to that matchup. Like I think that could be a fun matchup. All right, our offense versus their defense. Their defense is bad. I mean, it's 29th in yards, 29th in points per game. And I th- they just don't force – like, let's start we'll start with the run game. Like, they uh, you know, they are ranked 29th in rushing. They don't force negative runs. One, I don't think their defensive ends are physical at all, you know, uh, and, and Owosu and Darrell Taylor. And their linebackers play at such – such depth like they're they play at depth which again stops big plays and stuff whether they're running too high or single high cover three you know old, old seattle defenses or they've you know changed a little more too high um this season they just give a lot of cushion with their linebackers and again without having a, a very physical front i think this is a game where saquon's just going to go off and it's going to be i don't think this is a first half, second half type of game for Saquon where it's like oh, first half, a little slow second. Like they don't force negative runs. They don't, you know. So I think we're going to be able to get four or five yards of pop the entire game. I don't care if they stack the box. I think we're going to be able to get four or five yards of pop the entire game in, st- uh, in this game. And I think we're going to see them. Last week they went to DJ early in the passing game, especially with Neil out, Azudu out, or Neil, Neil out, Azudu in at left guard. I think we're going to see a heavy run first half. Yeah, uh, I think that'll be helpful at the line of scrimmage in terms of communication. You know, if you're throwing the ball, maybe there's a little bit more communication that needs to happen, or at least if you're yelling to the offensive lineman, they're right there, versus if there's communication that needs to go to the wide receivers, because I think the crowd is going to play an impact. Um, I, I think I think they are. And the most important thing, Bobby, if you are going to run it on early downs, you just can't get into third and longs. You can't get into third and longs because um, – you know, I hate that I'm talking about the crowd, the crowd, the crowd, but you know, the crowd will come into effect when you're in a third and long and you're in an obvious passing situation. Um, you know, that goes into the ultimately the Seahawks' favor. Um, and even Tyreek Woolen's been balling out. I don't know what he's done the last couple of weeks. Is, is he still on a string of interceptions? I don't think he is. But uh, Tyreek Woolen's been balling out for them, and he was a corner that I really vouched for in this year's draft. Subtle flex. Uh, Kobe Bryant has been a good nickel corner for them as well, too. He's starting uh, too. They're their nickel corner. That's awesome. Um, we love. Yeah, those they, guys. they're they're playing young. Seattle's done a good job drafting DBs. Um, Tyreek Woolen had four games in a row with with an interception. One uh, so against Atlanta, Detroit, New Orleans, Arizona did not get an interception against Los Angeles. That's nuts. Nuts. With throwing the ball on them, like they give up the middle of the field and those checkdowns. Like, again, they play with a ton of cushion, a ton of cushion. You know, Tariq Wool has been able to jump and bounce on plays, and I think they've coached him up well to do that type of stuff. Um, they get, like, go look at their games every week. The leading receiver is usually a tight end or a running back. You know, like, they 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 give up. You know, last week I think Eckler had, like, 11 catches. Kyle Pitts was the – you know, remember Kyle Pitts wasn't getting any type of run from the Falcons? Uh, you know, like uh, targets, that was, was the game, game that he finally got his run, was versus the Seahawks. So, t- I think that now, Saquon, I, I obviously I want him to be very involved in that. How do we feel about the tight ends without Daniel Bellinger? I still think you just give those easy targets to Chris Myrick 
Tan, I think Tanner Hudson might be involved a little more too. Um, and then I do think Lawrence Cage is probably going to get called up for the week. Well, Tanner Hudson was starting to get more involved. Like remember the Dallas game and around that part of the season where Tanner Hudson was getting some catches and getting some run. And then he kind of just faded off a little bit, partially because I think Daniel Bellinger started playing better. Yeah. Like uh, there was a certain point of the season where I was betting on like and in my brain, I'm like, I think Tanner Hudson's going to be the first tight end to get a touchdown or more, more than anybody else. So that obviously was wrong because every time Daniel Bellinger touched the ball the last couple of weeks, it's basically been a touchdown. So I would like to see a little bit of a return of Tanner Hudson. If it's open, if it's available this week, let's do it. Yeah. I just thought, you know, we want to get in the heavy formations and run versus them, uh, you know, the two tight end stuff. Because they, they're not, they, they don't have a lot of strength on that front and they still play with light boxes, Justin. I just remember this because we're talking about tight ends. Do we bring in Nick Gates as the jumbo tight end? This oh, week? boy. His first snaps for the New York Giants were as a jumbo tight end versus the Dallas Cowboys week one of 2019. Did they, did Dable talk about that during his presser? No, he did, see, but they did say, like, hey, like, is he, like, ready to play? And, like, yeah, this is why we did this. Like, they don't activate him if he's not ready to play. No, Justin. which is bizarre, man. I I, I just – I mean, I – I want it so bad. I want Nick Gates playing jumbo snaps this week. I can't I believe he so did bad. it. He's a, he's a fucking warrior, man. It's unreal. And if he can get back to close to what his 2020 le- level of play was, he should be the starting center. You know, I know there's more to center than just blocking. Like, you got to set protection stuff. And I think Feliciano's done a good job with that type of stuff, you know, having familiarity with the offense. But, man, like, he is just a much better player than Feliciano. You know, the numbers back that up. The eye test backs that up. He's a much better player than him. I don't know what he's going to be coming back from the injury, so I, I'm not banging on the table being like, where's Nick Gates? Where's Nick Gates? But you know what I do? I want to see some jumbo jumbo tight end Nick Gates. Like, let's let's test the water and see what this guy can actually do. Um, on an NFL field. Like, and that's a perfect way to do it because guess what? He's going to block better than a tight end. And now that you have Daniel Bellinger out, Lawrence Cager running jumbo sets with Tanner Hudson and Lawrence Cager is probably not the most ideal thing to do. Bring Nick Gates in for those. I will get out of, I will get up from my couch if they do that. Like for that play. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited for that. Um, guys on their front. And Chen and, and Wosu, he, now he does lead the NFL in pressures. Uh, but he mo- he's going to face up against Andrew Thomas mostly, not worried about him. Are we worried about Darrell Taylor versus Tyreek uh, Phillips? Because he is a speed guy, and, and Phillips can struggle with speed a little bit. I think give they're going to give a lot of help. Give him help, yeah. Chip him, force him inside. Yeah. All right, anything else before we kick it to this interview? No. All right, today's episode is sponsored by SeatGeek. Live events are back, which means you can get $20 off tickets at SeatGeek with promo code GIANTS. If you don't know what SeatGeek is, they're a ticketing app that makes buying tickets super simple. Maybe you can, whether it's football, concerts, basketball, baseball, festivals, or more, SeatGeek put tickets from all over the web in one place to make buying simple. Hey, if you want to go see a Chiefs game and watch Kadarius Tony walk up and down the sideline, that's the game to go to. By the way, I didn't bring up this uh, stat in our Kadarius Tony episode. So everyone's like, he hasn't played in 12, 24 games. He's only played in 21% of the snaps of his time as a New York Giant for the offense. Yeah. Like 21%. Like, so it's not like not that he doesn't, he's only played in half the games. It's in half of those games, he's barely played too. SeatGeek rates every ticket from zero to 10 to make sure you are getting a good deal. Green means good. Red means bad. Every ticket on SeatGeek is backed by their buyer guarantee. So you can shop for tickets with confidence. Don't worry, we've got the hookup. Use code GIANTS for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase with promo code GIANTS. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. And here is Matty Brown. I would now welcome on to the uh, program. He covers the Seahawks for uh, his Substack Seahawks on tape, hosts the Seattle Overload, um, and does stuff for Underdog Fantasy. Matty Brown. Matt, uh, how how you feeling? We were talking about before where you know we were supposed to be two bottom feeders of the NFL, and we got the first place Seahawks versus this you know second best record in the NFL with the New York Giants. Yeah, how about that? Very exciting. Um, very exciting to be on the podcast as well. Thanks for having me on. And yeah, the experts, you know, they they, they, they didn't know so much, did they? Now the NFL does seem to be upside down in general, but I have faith that both our teams. 
why can't they go and do it? Why can't they keep winning? I, I always start these off with, with uh, you know, the defense. What what is the like bread and butter of the Seahawks defense? You know, like this, you know, single high safety versus two high safety, stack box, light box, and like their kind of go to coverages. Well, that's a complicated question because I think the defensive struggles for a lot to start this year with them kind of figuring out, hey, what is our bread and butter here? Last year, they and the year before, prior as well, 2020 to 2021, they started running bare fronts at a lot higher rates, but it was still mainly with the sort of peak Howell coverage system, right? Of, um, you know, the cover three stuff. Now they blended in some new kind of like half quarter quarter, uh, which they called Clio, but that was like Vic Fangio's cover eight, right? And Clint Hurt on the staff, who's now the defense coordinator, he had spent time with Fangio. So naturally, bare fronts were working well. Um, their issue last season was the fact that they couldn't really stop the check down, which I put down mainly to the pass rush. But if you actually went and looked at their defense, like in total points allowed, you know, it's not the best. There's some variance there, but they actually performed better, you know, than and the tape was showing signs of progress. It, might, it was my belief. So naturally, you think, oh, Hurts now the defense coordinator. They're fully embracing a Fangio system. They're using Fangio language. Like the first time Pete's gone away from his language in forever, like he was using like a Kiffin derivative. Uh, and and he's like given her a lot of control to and and his young staff, like Sean Desai brought in from Chicago to do his stuff. And now, lo and behold, they're back to the bare fronts, which <laughs> there's a complicated history of that, which I've, I've, I've wrote on. We don't have time for that today, but it works. And and it's, it's working now. They've sort of... The, the other thing which was going on is they were still running bare fronts uh, earlier in the season, but the techniques, they were asking a lot of their sort of exterior, uh, you know, their interior defensive linemen, like the the guys over the guards or the tackles, they were telling them in the bare fronts to mirror step a lot more. So even in middle field closed, when they were, you know, technically gapped out in the box, they were having these guys read and react off the tackle. So, uh I'm going to line up on the inside uh, shoulder of a tackle and wherever he goes, I'm going to take a six inch slightly lateral step and mirror him and look to play into the B gap, but really one and a half gaps into the C gap too. What Seattle's done now technique wise is they're playing more aggressive up front and yeah, they still use a four eye. Like if there's a tight end to, to a side to sort of help out, or if there's a, a, a quarter safety behind them, they still use that to kind of buy time for the course of safety to join the run fit. But they've gone back to being most of the time a lot more aggressive up front and playing much more three techniques where they're on the outside shoulder of the guard. They can take a six inch power step. They can knock the uh, heck out of, uh, of the guard. And then that helps the linebackers behind because they're not having, if you're playing off a mirror step in four eye, you're having to sort of slow play it and think, Okay, I'm gonna uh, you know stack track and fall back off this. Where well, when you've got a three technique, he's just he's guaranteed to keep the guard off you because he's one on one with that guy and he's gonna smack the heck out of him. Then you can be you can play with more insurance than a shoot gaps and and play more aggressive up front. Yeah, a uh, lot lot to unpack there. But basically, they've gone back to the bare fronts. And in this past Chargers game, we saw some new wrinkles where they rather than having the second edge defender as uh, another outside linebacker type, which means Cody Barton comes off the field and it's a three, three, five, but like what, what the fan Chi would call penny where you have, uh, you, you have a nickel in, you have Jordan Brooks, the inside linebacker in, and then you have a safety like uh, Ryan Neal in, and then two outside linebacker types. They had one outside linebacker type, which they actually had Bruce Irvin off the street, but he, he set the edge really well. And then the other edge, they either use a nickel uh, in Kobe Bryant, who ain't like your typical guy. And so there's all these little adjustments they're getting to get guys into matchups. I don't know if you'd see that against the Giants because uh, I think they'll probably be wanting a bit more heavier personnel. I think they're very concerned about, you know, Herbert's ability to, to pass the football. Okay. Um, yeah, a, a lot to unpack there with that. Um now they're struggling. I mean, they're giving up the fourth most points per game, and you look at the numbers and like, okay, they're bottom ten in rushing and passing. Like, what are offenses attacking in all of that to really get their get their yardage against Seattle? Well, to start the season, everything was wrong. Like they 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 couldn't stop anything. I'd say 
the shoots of progress, you started to see that emerging during the Saints game where other than Taysom Hill, uh, like, you know, them inexplicably not being able to stop Taysom Hill just by, you know, everyone knows what Taysom Hill is going to do. Um, yeah, I, I actually watched a play of that where they they brought in two extra O-linemen and then three tight ends and then just ran power for right. like a 50-yard touchdown. Right, 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 right. That, that hurt. Um, I think actually to, to that point, I think, they were caught out a bit by the formation. So they did power out that and then they, and it was like a heavy formation. They didn't match the personnel. I don't think they prepared properly for that. And then the other thing they had issues with was empty quarterback draw, uh, which again, I don't think they expected it, but I mean, come on, like you should have, but you could see other than that, a bit more shoots of progress. And then the Detroit game, more shoots of progress too, where uh, it, even though they got past all over on like you know you can see them establishing the building blocks and then these last two games against Arizona where they revert they changed their techniques they played more aggressive the bare fronts and then this past game against the Chargers where they built on that and they built on the layers of that so what I'm saying really is the weak point hasn't quite made itself known now because they've sort of changed their defense from um how it was looking at the start of the season but the, the big thing I think for the Giants will be, you know, like I, I saw them running uh, power with, with Saquon and six offensive linemen. Like Seattle still hasn't shown that they can stop that kind of attack. They still haven't shown they can stop a mobile quarterback in like a, a Daniel Jones type. Like Mariota gave him fits uh, and his legs gave him fits. Uh, they prepared heavily for Trey Lance. He got hurt, so we didn't quite see how that was going to pan out, but it started rough. And then, you know, we've talked about what Taysom Hill did. So I don't, I think the Giants, you know, their, their versatility on offense, but also the, that blend of like quarterback and Barkley, like Seattle hasn't really had that matchup test uh, yet. And they've had elements of that. And when they've had that, it's been bad. Um, so, it, yeah. Um, is, is there a guy that on the front that will give like offensive line issues? Um you know, because I mean, you look at the depth chart and you don't see any names that like pop out at you. So that's that's what's really cool about. Uh, well, you know, it's double edged sword, right? But I, in my view, that's what's cool about this front because now you have like a, a pretty much like a, almost a six deep rotation of interior dudes who will bash you up. Like Al Woods, it's kind of crazy. I, I guess it's because he's old, but like he kind of reminds me of like, like a, what Snacks Harrison did. And I know that's like high praise. I don't want to, don't want to get into a, <laughs> I don't want to upset Giants fans there by saying he's on a similar level, but he is like, and, and if you look at his testing, right, he has something like, I'm, I'll just pull it up, but he, he's a real problem as the nose tackle, just being an absolute immovable mass. He was dealing with a knee thing, but he came back in the last game. Yeah, so he's he's six four, three hundred nine pounds. But the big thing is he had uh, thirty six inch long arms, so that kind of gives you an idea. Yeah, <laughs> and he and he jumped thirty seven inches in the vertical. <laughs> this was back in uh, I don't know, two thousand and ten, maybe. Yeah, but um, so he's been around the block. But he he's he's that kind of just big, long, explosive, like low key explosive dude. But then you you know Puna Ford is really playing a lot better now. He's actually really able to play three tech he's like squats and and low pad level because he's short um shelby harris has come in 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 the infamous russell wilson trade uh he he's kind of nice and disruptive and fits in there brian monet is a good backup nose tackle quinton jefferson can can play the three tech pretty good as well and then there's miles adams so that's what i'm saying about at about the rotation but there's all these kind of they've got little stylistic uh differences that make it uh, tricky on an offensive line on the offensive side i mean that's what has been enthralling about seattle this year and you know the entire nfl knows geno smith you play you know you play for the jets and then you know you're the guy that eli got benched for finally getting his shot again leading the nfl in completion percentage but still has like a good average depth of target like what is what is ha has happened in this resurgence of geno smith i mean this is awesome this is absolutely awesome. And I'd love to know, um, perhaps we can talk about it another time, but I'd love to know what what happened in New York, you know, how much of an opportunity was he given? I like, didn't McAdoo didn't McAdoo play him 
uh, uh, and then get fired shortly afterwards. Yeah, he got fired for that. He didn't get an opportunity, which, again, I'll never apologize. You know, Eli Manning is he's like the number one face for the New York Giants of all time, yeah. besides him and Lawrence Taylor. Uh, but yeah, he never he never actually had a shot with the Giants. Right, right, and it's interesting because he like there are elements to his game where he looks like Eli Manning, like. <laughs> He, he, you know, he's that pocket passer. There's total command. And what's been really uh, great to see is, so in 2021, he comes in for that stretch of games. The offense is still kind of Wilsonified, right? Like it, I mean, there's been so much coverage of how you have to run the Russell Wilson offense with Russell Wilson. I mean, I, I think that's not specifically unique to him. Like every quarterback has strengths and weaknesses. Every player does. But Gino in the kind of Russ style offense came in, and, you know, he looked great until he threw a pick against the Rams when he came in unexpectedly. It wasn't his fault. Lockett just tripped over the middle. But then you saw a process of, this is pretty good play. This is pretty good play. He didn't have that finish in him. And then against the Jaguars, he, uh, which I pronounced differently to you guys, <laughs> he uh, he comes in and he, he carves them up. And it's, it's Jacksonville, right? They, they couldn't cover anyone. Be like, they're playing tight. They're trying to play tight camp man coverage here. Gino's reading this out and he's accurate. He's like on point with everything. He's making really sound decisions. Okay, might be something to work with here. Then Russell Wilson comes back. He comes back too soon. He stinks the place up. Uh, it's bad. And, and then he gets traded. So heading into the offseason, you know, okay, well, you know, Gino did show something there, but is he the answer? Like, can he be the answer? And I was a bit ignorant of the history, like, you know, what he'd shown in, in the past in the NFL as well. I know there's been a lot of Geno truthers out there. But then the preseason and the offense doesn't score any touchdowns, really. But that's not really through Geno's fault. Like they're making really bad mistakes there uh, across the board that, that, you know, they're getting bogged down by penalties, drives are stalling in the red zone, but not through Geno's errors necessarily. But more importantly, his process is like flawless. He's like, I think. I think that's why he has so much support like from film Twitter because he plays quarterback how like you know when you rewind the play and you're like oh well he, you can see him play and the contrast between that and Russell Wilson where Russell's like you know improvisation ability at his best is off the charts but he's sometimes making decisions where you're like well that's not by the book like that's not how I've learned football like how can, how can you do that whereas Gino is like structured and just precision stuff and so you, you come into the you come into the season and the process continues, but then they stop making the mistakes uh, on the offense so much. And he comes in red hot. And in terms of regression and stuff like that, well, you know, they're a pass first offense. They're there's they're like 60% um pass rate on, you know, in neutral situations on early downs. Like, again, Pete Carroll, not really a run-heavy coach. He just kind of uh, had that reputation because I think with Russell at a certain point, if you can't, I don't want to get bogged down into that, but if you can't do certain things, you the only choice you have is to run the football. Anyway, but with Gino, they're, up, they're, they're, they're letting him uh, pass quite a bit. And there was an interesting conversation where the offense, you know, it, was, it wasn't quite hitting its full potential uh, in the first few games, but then after San Francisco, where they they had a really tough time, after that game, Pete's like, we need to, we need to have full faith in Gino. We need it to be unrestricted because I think they came in with an element of training wheels to say, are we seeing it? Is it real? And then it was real. They they took the the training wheels off. They've they've been a complete the most expansive Seahawks passing game I've seen because I I started watching the Seahawks. In 2012, I started watching football in 2012. And so all I've known in the Seahawks offense other than preseason is Russell Wilson, right? But th this is like any area of the field they're, they're accessing. And, and the best part is, I think, with this transition to across the league, of a, a lot more like, you know, middle field open coverages, too high defenses. Where's the weak point in that? Where well, you have to be able to stretch uh, the defense and and then hit the intermediate areas. Russell, that wasn't always strength. He'd turn down like like stick dig. He'd turn down the, the dig element. He'd just throw the stick and then defenses start camping on the stick because you they know you're not going to stretch the and, and stress the intermediate. Gino, on the other hand, like really impressive accessing that. And you know, like they're they're second in points third 
points earned per passing play, which is ahead of the Chiefs, you know, like, <laughs> this is real. Uh, and then their run game, I, I, may, I briefly mentioned that, but they haven't lent on their run game, I think, as much um, throughout the season as people would have expected, but they're starting to get that going. I think chemistry's gelling. The loss of Rashad Penny is obviously a big deal, but Kenneth Walker looks like a real, real problem. And he's like only scratching the surface of what he can be. Like he's still making some rookie errors and he's still sort of learning, you know, when, when to have the opportunity in the NFL and when, Hey, let's just hit the hole here. But like, he, he looks like a really explosive talent. And I mean, if you think about like Wink Martindale and I've seen some of your, your cut-ups of like pressure looks and these kind of exotic things he does. I think, yeah, like, a good game to watch is the Detroit game where Seattle checked into a, you know, a, a gap run to like run on, the, they'll run on those exotic looks if they get them on that like third and long and stuff. So that'll be an interesting kind of chess match if, if we get that kind of scenario play out. Right. I'm right, Maddie. Where can uh, people uh, follow you and get some more information on the Seahawks? Cause I, I know uh, our fans uh, eat that type of stuff up. So you can follow me on Twitter at Matty F. Brown. Uh, you can also find my podcast at Seattle Overload. You can find my Substack at Seahawks on Tape. And you can also see if, if you're interested in the wider NFL. And I wanted to do the Giants this week, but we had a, a schedule in. Uh, everyone wanted to do the Giants this week. Uh, you can find that at Underdog, the Underdog Fantasy Film Room on YouTube. I, do, I cover like an NFL X's and O's topic or player uh, from the week prior all right i appreciate you man uh we'll we'll talk soon and uh good luck thank you very much for having me and uh yeah enjoy the game should have been sunday night football i know right we're we're gonna get flexed at some point this season yeah 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 all right we now welcome on to the program the number one he didn't let me down on the weather it was pretty warm in jacksonville got some nice sun out of it Danny King, weatherman Dan, what's the weather looking like in Seattle this week? Is it going to rain? Luckily, you were in Jacksonville because it was sunny. Because in Seattle, it's not going to be sunny. It's going to be raining throughout the day. Uh, it's just going to be light rain all throughout the game. You got uh, 59% uh, precipitation probability. So good chance if you're going to Seattle, you're probably going to get a, a little soaking. Not not like a big one, but like a little soak. You might get a tad bit wet. And that's just always Seattle's weather. So, I mean, it's nothing new. You do what you signed up for. What's the temperature like? Oh, the temperature. How did I forget the temperature? It's going to be 53 degrees. It's going to be it's going to be a little chilly and that rain's going to make it just a tad bit worse, but it's it's going to be a chilly day in Seattle. 50, 53 and rain. That that's that's pretty damn horrible. Thank no God wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh all right, so let's do some trivia before we get into the rest of the segments. What is your trivia for the Giants Seahawks this week? All right, so two Giants have Two receiving touchdowns against the Seattle Seahawks. The first one is Ernest Gray. Who is the second one? Giants wide receivers? Yeah. G- Giants players receiving touchdowns. I might have said Giants wide receiving touchdowns. Two Giants have two receiving touchdowns. Well, it's not Alfred Morris. He has one. <laughs> yeah. He has two touchdowns, but one receiving touchdown. Um. I'm going to say Cruz. Yeah, Cruz had a good game in 2011. Uh, I'm going to say Plax. Like, uh, there was an 05 game that took years off my life. I'm going to say Plax. The Jay Feely game. Oh, yeah. my gosh. I, I never I, – I, oh, I hate Jay Feely because of that game. What a scumbag Jay Feely is. So, see, Victor Cruz has won touchdown not to the answer i was looking for is actually sonorous moss back in week week five of the 2008 season he had two touchdowns on four catches for 45 yards so him what? and Ernest gray receive a touchdown leaders against the seattle seahawks also based off a of google photo sonorous moss might be a doctor now i'm not certain but he was in a doctor's coat I, miami legend i lo- i love i wanted some more sonorous moss because i you know uh, say Santana Moss's uh, obviously brother, and Santana Moss was a really good wide receiver. I also wanted, I believe Chad Jackson, the wide receiver out of the Gators, was uh, came out that year, and the Patriots drafted him, and he sucked. Um, but I just wanted him. Um, Sonora. Yeah, Sonoris Moss. San, uh, San, that that was the year we traded down, and the, we traded down to the Steelers, and the Steelers got San Antonio Holmes. We got Sonoris Moss. 
Talking Giants circa 2008, um, if Sonoris Moss catches two touchdown passes, we're like saying, is this a breakout game for Sonoris Moss? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, uh, fantasy, fan- our fantasy draft. So we uh, we every every week we do uh, four, four rounds of picking players from the Giants team and the the team the Giants are playing. I am in first place after another great week. After 48 points, I'm at 250 points. Danny is still in second place. He's 46 points back. But Justin is right there in third. He's only 1.8 points behind Danny for second, but still 48 points behind me. I will be picking first this week. And it's oh, it's simple. I think the Giants should run the ball a ton in this game. And I think they're going to run the ball to some success. And I think the running back checkdowns should be there. Even though Saquon has not been that involved in the receiving game for the Giants this year. But this week will be a little different. I'm going Saquon Barkley with 1-1. Easy pick. Justin. Justin, you have pick two. I had two guys on my big board in my brain because my brain can only handle two people at once. And number one on my big board was Kenneth Walker this week. Saquon Barkley was number two. So I'm glad that Bobby went the homer route. Um, Giants defense has had trouble stopping the run. They've had trouble in particular stopping the big explosive rushing play. They're one of the teams in the NFL that have given up the most uh, explosive rushing plays. They have a lot of trouble giving up runs outside the tackles and stopping that. And that's exactly what the Seahawks offense does well. So give me Kenneth Walker. I feel good about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm the homer for picking the NFL's leader in scrimmage yards. Definitely. You are. Um, instead of some damn rookie who dances too much and bounces it. All right, Danny, you have back-to-back picks. Back-to-back picks. Go me. Uh, first one is going to be, what's his name? Tyler Lockett. Tyler Lockett uh, with DK yep. Metcalf out. It's just, it's just obvious he's probably going to be the next guy up. So, of course, just why not go a little... Tyler Lockett in my life. Uh, what? Wait, what's wrong with Matt Caffigan? Does he have a knee injury? Is that what happened to him last week? I don't know, but he's out like two to four weeks, so he's okay. out. One of my favorite DK Metcalf uh, moments is when Smoke and Woody DM'd him before the Seahawks game, and then after the game, and then got blocked by DK Metcalf. You can probably find that on Smoke and Woody's Twitter. Right, <laughs> wait, who's your, should who's... I? Oh, wait, no. I can't post. It was James Bradbury and DK Metcalf. Damn. Yeah. I, mean, I want to post. fans if, got pissed at us. And if we Kayvon won gets a sack, I'm going to do the same thing, and I'm going to put Kayvon's face and then Charles Cross's face. That's there we go. There. You may, we could just do it before the game. Yeah. Confidence. Write, All right, write that Danny, down. who's your second pick? All right, thank you guys for stalling. My second pick is going to be actually a Wandale Robinson, little the Look little this. giant on the New York Giants. Uh, obviously – is the guy that was quote unquote holding him back, even though he that wasn't play, was Kadarius Doty. So Wandale Robinson is probably going to try and fill that role Tony was supposed to play. Uh, and obviously, he's probably going to be a big run day because obviously, with uh, Evan Neal out, Van Bredis it out, the off the line is kind of in shambles at the moment. But I like what Wandale Robinson brings. And his, in his game last week, he dominated the week before that in Baltimore 12 points, 11 points. Wandale Robinson gets me points and uh, just give him a little, little crosser and then just let that man run. Man speaking, run. speaking of uh, of Kadarius Tony, someone you should buy someone's Kadarius Tony jersey off of them for like 30 bucks. I am I am investigating all routes. I'm waiting to see if a discount comes into place, or I will be reaching out to certain individuals to be like, let's talk game on your jersey. If people don't un- re- know what we're talking about, Danny buys the first round picks jerseys every single year, and for some reason you didn't get Tony's. Like they sent it, they sent you the wrong one, or they didn't send they, it, or something like they, that. They outright canceled the order. They're like, hey, we just can't ship you this jersey. And right then and there, I knew Tony was not going to work out as a wide receiver for the Giants. It was in my immediate sign. I was like, all right, I'm going to wait a little until this price goes down because no shot he makes it the full four years as a New York Giant. And it didn't leave me wrong because every other jersey has has came besides that one. Danny King has a DeAndre Baker jersey. Like this is this is this is not a, a joke. Like this is something that he actually does. I'm so committed he, to the cause. I want I want to show like my kids when I'm older, be like, look at all these failures we've had. So when Dave Gilman trades for an extra first round pick, Danny's not happy. He's thinking like, damn it. Like, I was I, in, just... I was in shambles. Uh, what was it last year when uh, we had two first round picks? Gilman cost or, you some money, like trading up for DeAndre me. Baker. 
trading oh. Odell for Dexter Lawrence. Like he 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 was wheeling and dealing. That was three hundred dollars that year. Uh, um, so you got to get. So what would you do? Are you like sad, happy, like screw Kadarius Tony at at this point, Danny King? I mean, I like Kadarius Tony. I thought he uh, was going to be a good addition to us, but the injuries apparently, uh, and it's just his personality. It just kind of made it hard to fully get in on him. I'm going to root for him in Kansas City because I, I think he's just got to get a better shot at it, and I think maybe it will happen there. Yeah, he's just dumb um, right. and and always injured, you know, which, and again, I have no problem with dumb people. Like, I don't. Like, you need dumb people on a football team, but he was just – it was too much. It's, it's, it really does suck that this is the way it ended. All right, Justin, you have your second pick. Will Disley. Um, his yards per catch is higher than Noah Fant. Um, he has one less catch than Noah Fant, but he also has two more touchdowns. So give me Will Disley. I've been swinging at the fences recently thinking that, you know, who can I pick guys that can most likely give me touchdowns? And that philosophy of the last couple of weeks has been working for me. So I was hoping you were going to go someone else and I was going to double up on the Seahawks tight ends. So I am going to go Noah Fant with my second pick. Let's see. Who am I going to go with my third pick? Um, let's see. Let's see. There's an you obvious the, pick here. No. Well, I was thinking about doing the guy that's stepping in for... Put the water. You know, I'm going to go Darius Slayton. Yeah, that's the obvious pick here. Uh, I had someone else above him on the big board, but I'm just... It's going to be the little homer to me. The Giants have, are good at stopping wide receivers. Um, but I just worry because they play off coverage. It can... You know, I don't know how many curl routes... Like, curl routes kill the Seahawks. I don't know how many curl routes we're going to run. But I'll go Slayton since he kind of is their wide receiver one. And RPOs and stuff. We'll, we'll, I, Darius Slayton is who I'm going. Justin, your third pick. Um, Marquise Godwin. It's Marquise Goodwin. My gosh. Whoop. Um, Marque- Marquise Godwin. <laughs> Marquise. No, he had a touchdown last week in uh in relief of DK Metcalf. I so. absolutely hate you for that pick, Justin. That's who I was <laughs> debating of going. There was actually a wild card I was also debating. So, Danny, you have back to back picks. Your last two picks. Marquise Godwin. Uh. uh... You know what? Let's let's have fun with it. I'm gonna I'm gonna take Tanner Hudson. Uh, it's probably gonna be Chris Myrick that scores a touchdown. So yep. do it do that as you will. But I'm gonna take Tanner Hudson because he realistically uh, is the backup tight end for uh, this New York of Football Giants team. And then now I just legitimately don't know what to do after this because there's a part of me that really wanted to take uh, uh, what the heck's his name Matt Breida because he gets carries. But you're gonna say there's an obvious pick. I'm not gonna take the obvious pick. You know what? He's gonna bounce back this week. DJ is gonna give him an opportunity to score a touchdown this week. I am taking Marcus Johnson. That's not a bad pick. I, I didn't think I don't think there's an obvious pick, but I thought there might be a good strategy to go with your third pick. Um, Justin, your last pick. My last pick. Chris Myrick. Got to touch. Damn him. it! See, I wanted Chris Myrick so bad. I really Damn wanted it, Chris Myrick. Gonna, He's going to get touches this lead. week. Oh, I thought Danny no. might double up on the tight ends and be like, I know the tight ends get catches versus the Seahawks. I'm going to get both of them and hedge my bets. I wanted Chris Myrick so freaking bad. Oh, that pisses me off. Tough. Their number three tight end gets some run. But I'm not going to take a number three tight end. Richie James has kind of been phased out of the of the offense. So there's two people I go here. A guy I liked in the draft. In fact, he, he is my third round pick for the Giants in the mock draft uh, of 2021. Uh, you know, I was going to go Dwayne Eskers, but I'm just going to go Matt Breida. Like, he's at least going to get a couple of carries. I think I the Seahawks that. defense sucks, so I'm going to bet on Matt Breida against him. So, to recap, I have Saquon, Noah Fant, Darius Slayton, Matt Breida, Justin S. Kenneth Walker, Will Disley, Mark Marquise Godwin, as he would say, or Marquise yep. Goodwin, as a normal person would say, Chris Myrick, <laughs> Danny has Tyler Lockett, Wandale Robinson, Tanner Hudson, and Marcus Johnson. All right, time for Giant Factors, where we pick our X Factor for the game. 
there was two players at one position that I went back and forth on this, but I'm going to take the guy who I know is going to get play 100% of the snaps, and that's Julian Luff, because these guys play a lot of tight ends, so which means you are going to be playing in the box, and we need to stop the run, okay? And they are great at the run, so we're going to need guys to get outside the tackles. I need Julian Love to do that. I need Julian Love to lock down guys in man coverage. I need him when he's playing zone coverages underneath to be able to make some instinct plays and maybe break up a pass or two, which he uh, hasn't really had underneath. It's only been deep. So Julian Love, you are my giant factor for the Giants in week eight versus Seahawks. Let's go seven and one, Julian Love. Justin, you are next. Let's go seven and one, Julian Love. My giant factor, a little out of the box. I'm going with Josh Zudu. Josh Azudu, man, you're coming in for Ben Bredesen. Even though there's some injuries to the Giants' offensive line, there's still some guys that are sniffing at your job. Nick Gates, he may be sniffing at your job. Go out there, have a good game against an interior defensive line against Seattle, which hopefully you can handle. Go out there, open some holes for Saquon Barkley like you did in the fourth quarter of last week's game against Jacksonville. Help the Giants become 7-1. and one. Be a giant factor. Be stable and steady in pass pro. And let's do it. Josh Azudu. Danny, who is your giant factor for week 8? I thought Justin took my guy. I was like, wait, what? I didn't expect it to go this route. I'm I'm also going with the offensive line. Ooh. And, I'm, and I'm going for the guy that who's, his backup's nipping at his heels or technically he's holding his spot. I'm going with John Feliciano this week. Mainly comes the same reason as Justin. This offensive line's in flux right now with Tyree Phillips playing at right tackle. You got Josh Azudu playing at left guard. So really, we're going to need to rely on Thomas Gwinski. And Feliciano, Feliciano's the guy out here calling out these protections that Jones sees, all that fun jazz. So Feliciano, show why you're here. We know why you're here, but if you start to little fumble around now, Nick Gates is right there. And if he is ready to play, and he's ready to play if he's on a 53-man roster, he'll take your job because Nick Gates is a quality center. So Feliciano, you need the ball out this week, and make sure Daniel Jones has time in the pocket. You're clearing lanes for those inside runs. Do what you got to do. Feliciano, you're a Giants factor, baby. All right. Time for spread picks. In last place, the listeners at 26 and 29. And at first place, as always, is Danny King at 29 and 26. But, but, week. but, Danny went 2 and 6 last week. Which is, hey, everyone's entitled to a bad week. I went 5 and 3, which is, you know, three games better. I am at 28 and 27, so I'm one game behind Danny. You know, that, sh- that shouldn't panic Danny. The real storyline of this week... Justin went 7-1, and one, and he was 7-0 and oh heading into Monday Night Football. He went from the laughing stock of everyone makes fun of Justin's spread picks to now he's one game back. He's above 500, and he is in second place at tied tied with me at 28-27. and 27. Justin, oh, how are you feeling? One game back in the lead. Yeah, how are you feeling yeah, being 7-1? and one? You know, honestly, I'm trying not to think about it too much. I'm trying to not let it get to my head. I'm trying to just come out here. Have another good week. It's about the process, Joe Judge. And uh, let's have another good week of picking him. All right. Before we get into the picks, Danny, who are the picks brought to you by? Well, I mean, as always, the picks are brought to you by our friends over at DraftKings Sports. Because if you are unaware, it's time for October baseball. And I'm betting on the action with the DraftKings Sportsbook app, an official sports bet, a partner of the World Series that time of year again. Right now, DraftKings Sportsbook has a championship-worthy offer you can miss. New customers can bet just $5 to win on any World Series game, any game they play, to win $200 in free bets if your team wins. If you want to boost your winnings even more, check out, check out the DraftKings Same Game Partner. Parlay, in which you could combine multiple bets from the same game for a bigger payout. The more legs you add, the more money you can win. Of course, this is a fascinating matchup. We got those Philadelphia Phillies, the dream team. They're dancing in the, you're watching you dance in the corner. Then you got the Astros, probably the best American League baseball team the world's ever seen. Uh, I can't think of, they're just the Yankees' let's, fathers. That's besides the point. <laughs> but, uh, what are you guys looking at this year? Who are you feeling is going to win the World Series? Because uh, the Astros are the favorites, but the Phillies, they're, they're like that underdog storyline. Phillies. Phillies, Bobby. Astros are winning. Astros are winning. And uh, some fun batter props. Uh, I'm betting Bryce Harper, Kyle Schwarber over a half home run against Justin Verlander on uh, tomorrow night's game. So 
using the DraftKings Sportsbook app. If you don't have it, please go download it because I think you're crazy if you don't. Uh, use promo code JOHNBOY and bet $5 to win $200 in free bets if your team wins. That is only at DraftKings Sportsbook. And then once again, you got to use the promo code JOHNBOY to get it done, people. So download that app today. Minimum age eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. MLB trademarks are, of course, used with permission. All right, first game. We got a good Thursday night football game. Ravens at Bucks minus two. The Bucks are really banged up. Like, they're really banged up in this game. Tom Brady's never lost three games in a row. But I think the Bucks are just a good matchup for the Ravens. Like, they stop the run really well. They force you to kind of get away from the run. Um, and I... I still have some faith in this Bucks offense, even though they put three points up against the Panthers. I'm going to go Bucks minus two. Justin, what are you going? If they actually let Tom Brady throw on early downs, I mean, they've been really, really stubborn with early down efficiency, and they've been really trying to run the ball. If they let Tom Brady actually throw, I think they'll be all right, but I think the Bucks are kind of in their own way right now. Um, so give me the Ravens in this one. Danny, are you going with me or Justin? I'm probably going with Justin because I agree with him. The Bucs are just, I don't, I don't know what's going on with the Bucs right now. Uh, I think the Ravens just have the opportunity to get it done. So, yeah, give me the, the Baltimore of the Ravens. So, if I if the Bucs win this, I could be tied with Danny King for first place at the, going into Sunday. The listeners also agree with me, represented by Issa Cortez. They are going Bucks minus two. Next game. And London, ESPN Plus. But that's so annoying that ESPN Plus is doing this. Like, are they, like, can we just, I pay for Sunday ticket. Let me watch the damn games. I just did the Prime thing. I bought a whole new TV for it. Now I got to do ESPN Plus. Broncos at Jags minus two. Justin, what do you got in this? Jags minus two. They're used to going to London. Well, I guess not this regime, but uh, Jags minus two. I think the Jags are a much better team than their record indicates. Uh, Danny, what do you think about uh, Russell Wilson doing high knees uh, on the plane and Russell Wilson trying to control his ability to shit? Did you also see that too, Danny? I don't I, think I that part see... was real. <laughs> the mm. I would have thing I, I think was fake. <laughs> True. But, I mean, I hate flying, and I don't know how that man can stand up on a cross-Atlantic flight and just casually start doing high knees. Like, what is, what, what is wrong with this guy? The best was the real press conference i mean it, it was it was cringe almost to the extent of aaron boone saying that he facetimed david ortiz and <laughs> describing the 2004 red sox beating the yankees i mean russell wilson trying to defend and give us his minute by minute hour by hour schedule while the plane was in the air going to <laughs> going to london was just insane and I, if i'm trying to sleep and there's somebody doing high knees like i'm thinking about tripping them like uh, that that goes through my head, tripping them, and then I want to go back to sleep. So um, I pick Jags minus two. <laughs> it's, it's sad y'all don't want to win, but I am picking the Jags own London. I am always picking the Jags in London. Jags minus two. Danny. And Russell Wilson says he doesn't get jet lag. That's just not humanly possible, so I don't believe that. I am also taking the Jags minus two and a half or two, whatever it was. And Nath- Nathaniel Hackett, might he be fired if they lose in London? They might not even let him on the plane. Could be fun. Listeners are also going Jags. Raiders at Saints plus one. What do you have in this one, Danny? Hmm. 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 I'm gonna. The Raiders are bad, but the Saints are also bad. Is, is Jameis Winston playing this week? No, Andy Dalton's the starter. Raiders. Okay, Justin. Yeah, uh, the Raider Danny, you said the Raiders are bad. I think the Raiders are another team that's better than their record ind- indicates right now. So I am going to go Raiders. This is basically a Derek Carr versus Andy Dalton game for me, and I'm going to go Derek Carr. It's not like the Spider-Man emoji no. like pointing at each other in this game? No. Yeah, I, I, got, I think the Raiders are just a better team, so that's another clean sweep um, because the, the listeners are also going. That. Yeah, I, I think I mean it's pretty simple. The Saints are kind of just a bad team right now. Although Chris Olave is really good. I'm very happy about being right about that. Good for you. Cardinals at Vikings minus my wide receiver one. Cardinals at Vikings minus three and a half. This is a tough spread. Um, but I'm going to go Vikings minus three and a half. Um, the Cardinals are like, to me, they're a team that like alternates covering every single week. And they cut, they did well against the Saints last week. And I just, 
you know, the Vikings are, are five and one, and I feel like they deserve some credit for that. And I, I think they're going to beat the Cardinals by, by at least four points. So I'm going Vikings, Vikings minus three and a half. The listeners are also going. Danny, who are you going? I think, I think they're turning a corner. I'm going to go the Arizona Cardinals. DeAndre Hopkins being back is just a plus. So I'm going to be taking Kyler. Oh, oh, did you write it down? No, I didn't write anything down. Vikings. I had to call a duty release week. Change that. It's the Minnesota Vikings. I completely forgot about that. Justin, are you going against the grain? Yeah, I'm going against the grain. I'm going uh, Cardinals plus three and a half. So this game will decide if Justin can tie Danny at that time of the day. Patriots at Jets plus two and a half. This one was tough. Because you're like, oh, the Jets, they're a better team than the Patriots. The Patriots just got beat by the Bears, and the Jets are, are good. Zach Wilson hasn't been very good. No. I think Belichick is going to have something in store for Zach Wilson. I really do. Like, I think he's going to cause a mess. But the Jets defense is really good, too. So I, I, I think the Patriots are going to win this game by one or two points. And for that reason, I am going Jets plus two and a half in this. But this was a tough one. Like this is not the this is the type of game that Bill Belichick can blow out a team, but I don't know. So I hate people who hate Bill Belichick, but that whole Mac Jones Bailey Zappy thing did be like, come on, man! Like this is you're getting this isn't good. This isn't a good thing to do, Bill. So I'm I'm going Jets, Danny. I swear I'm not copy, Bobby. Uh, I am also going the Jets. I know they lost Elijah Vera Tucker and uh, Brees Hall to season-ended injuries. Added James Robinson. Jets off line is still kind of missed. That's Justin. That was our answer why James Robinson didn't play really, get any touches, as they were yeah, trading James. him the next day. Yes. But uh, yeah, uh, the Jets are a fun team, uh, and I like fun teams, and I like when all New York teams are good. So it's a fun time. The listeners are going Jets. Are we doing a clean sweep again, Justin? Nope. I'm going Patriots because I think they're, they are going to blow out the Jets. I think Zach Whoa. Wilson, he's been good with the clean pocket, but he has been terrible, terrible under pressure. So when they lose AVT, that's really tough. They lost Brees Hall, who Brees Hall has been a guy that the last couple weeks, every single week, he's had like a top run of the week. He's been really explosive and fun, so... I know you traded for James Robinson, but I don't really think that does much. Um, so I think the Jets are going to get blown out, and I think the Jets are going to are come back down to earth this week. I'm kind of feeling envious I didn't pick the Patriots, but it is what it is. 49ers at Rams plus one. What do you have in this one, Justin? 49ers. Rams are bad. Yeah, I told myself last time, I'm like, you know what? I'm never picking the 49ers, the Rams against the 49ers again. Like, just for the rest of our spread pick them as long as it's Shanahan versus McVay I'm picking the 49ers 49ers minus one listeners went Rams plus one who are you siding with Danny I'm also siding with the you guys and the Niners because just, the Rams are just not a good team and the Niners they just are next game we got Packers at Bills minus 11 could you imagine Aaron Rodgers coming off of back to back MVPs is an 11 point underdog. And that's why I went Packers plus 11. Just Rodgers, you you, you got to figure something. It's Sunday night football, give us a closer game than this. I'm going Packers plus 11. The listeners are going Bills minus 11. Danny, are you circling the wagons? Are you circling the wagons? I can't go against myself here. I understand 11 points is a stupid spread. Is I realistically should be taking the Packers. <laughs> but with that said, Sunday night in Buffalo the wagons are gonna be circling so hard. It's it's crazy. I I, I kid you not. The Bills are bills. so good, dude. They they're literally like the number one offense and number one defense in the NFL this year. Um, Justin, who do you got in this? Packers, give me Sunday Night Football magic, man. At least make it a close game. And then the final game of the week, Monday Night Football, Bengals at Browns plus three and a half. I've been picking the Browns this cover a ton, and they've done me well. But I think the Bengals are are kind of getting their footing back a little bit. I'm going Bengals minus three and a half. Justin. Cincinnati's five and two against the spread this year. They did just lose Jamar Chase for a couple weeks, which sucks because I felt like 
I felt like my fantasy season was about to turn around. Antonio Gibson is like my RB2. Ramondre Stevenson's a top 10 running back. Got him in like the 100s. Joe, Joe Burrow's my quarterback. I stacked him with uh, uh, Chase, and I had Lamb, and I had Amon Ross St. Brown. All these guys were like starting to come back and do good. Give me the Bengals. <laughs> Bengals. Danny, who you got? What a long speech that was. It was beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful, just to end up right back and say part. Uh, I'm taking the uh, Cleveland Browns. Uh, Jamar Chase being missing is huge, and uh, the Browns are they uh, they all have a bounce back week this week. All right, listeners are going Bengals minus three and a half. All right, time for score predictions for Giants Seahawks. Danny, what is your score prediction for this weekend's game? I never expected we would be playing against Geno Smith in a starting role, and for Geno Smith to actually like be balling out, especially in the year 2022. This is really like their first quote really good opponent. I'm not a bit Ravens. I'm gonna have to go Seahawks. Uh, the Seahawks are just a good home playing team. That crowd's gonna play a factor this week, especially with the new offensive lineman and in, in, uh, uh, not Bredesen, Izudu and Tyree Phillips. We also don't have Cold McCoy. Major downside to this week's game. We don't got the sheriff leading us into battle, even though he didn't do much that game. But that's that's the point. Uh, Seahawks win. I'm gonna go. Let's go thirty four to 26 you guys are picking the six and one giants to lose danny or justin what's your what's yours i'm gonna come out of left field here man uh i'm worried about this game i'm worried about every game which is a good feeling as a giants fan i'm worried about this game it's a dangerous game i'm gonna come out of left field to my score prediction just when we think it may be a little bit of a score fest the Giants are going to win 19-13. to They're going to have to get gritty to do it. They're going to have to grind it out. They're going to have to play some good defense. 19-13, Giants win. So I am worried about the defense. Like, they've had back-to-back games where they've given up a ton of yards. They gave up a, their most yards of the year versus the Jaguars this week. But you hear that siren? You hear that? They're going to need the police after what we do to the Seahawks. They're going to need the paramedics after what we do to the Seahawks. Because guess what? You can talk about, oh, they they had Ben McAdoo had the right vision. Geno Smith had nothing to do with Eli being benched. Guess what? I don't care. I will forever despise that man because of what he represented, which was the benching of Eli Manning. I don't care if you say, oh, it's not logical to do that. Screw that. You don't think I am not losing the Geno Smith as a starting quarterback. I'm just not letting that happen. That's not going to happen. And we're going into a bye week. We're going to go into a bye week for, with a victory. I refuse to go into a bye week with a loss. And the Giants are going into the bye week at 7-1. and one, And they are going to do it in a style. 77-0 to zero Giants for, beat the Seahawks. We appreciate you guys. We'll see you guys on Monday for another Victory Monday podcast. This is your first podcast in a while without Kadarius Tony on the Giants. I don't know why I brought that up, but it is what it is. We'll see you guys then. Until then, let's go Big Blue.